It's a great pleasure to, to share with you the UNESCO vision on uh, all the topics that we are discussing over these uh, next three days, and we already started yesterday, as already mentioned. So before I move to my short presentation, uh, I wish to share something very personal. Please keep it between the hundreds of us in this room and some other hundreds, I hope, maybe thousands connected. Well, I graduated uh, in my country, which is Italy, in classical philology in uh, um, 1984. And I used, for my thesis and dissertation, uh, um, typewriting machine. You remember? The typewriting, those, uh, you know, ta -tra, ta -ta -ta -tra. may I ask in this room, still, the spirit is, uh, say the truth, only the truth, always. Who, raise your hands, please, who used their type, old-fashioned machine for their own dissertation, thesis, or something? Please, I have to. Okay, nice. So. You are boomers, like I am, okay? We are on the same page. And as boomers, talking also to the, the other side of the room, many of you, I see, didn't raise a hand, so I suppose they belong to the next generation, great. We saw, we passed through at least four digital revolutions. The first, the revolution which brought and carry us from the type machine to personal computer. I wrote my PhD dissertation on a personal computer, very proud of that, a few years later. The expansion of the internet, and uh, through the 90s, uh, all those uh, like me were in uh, academia or, or in uh, all, all other fields, started to send email and to be connected with the rest of the world, whatever the country, especially the North, but not exclusively. Then, next generation of uh, disruptive technology was, uh, where is my mobile? I mean, if you lose your mobile, you are lost. The smartphone, the mobile, which is now kind of, uh, you know, our own identity in a separate box. Whenever. And now, and of course, the social media networks and everything. And now, artificial intelligence. So, as boomers, uh, we have a big challenge, colleagues, <laughs> to go through these four big steps which dramatically change our lives. But now, we have to focus on education, whether and how these uh, big disruptions affected and now can give some opportunities to education. And we know that uh, each disruption uh, had, has had sweeping social and uh, educational implications, but we also know that not all people and not all countries have felt these technological revolutions in the same way. The new words they create have been sources everywhere of both hope and concern. And our conversation here is really very much between hope and concern. Well, let's start from the first step I already mentioned yesterday, the COVID-19 disruption. I think there is a presentation. We like very much to see uh, there is a presentation going on? Okay, can go, you can go. We are now at COVID-19. Yeah, I'm sure you recognize this map. It became in a few hours very popular worldwide. All the main media they, they took and they used to showcase how UNESCO was monitoring the disruption, unprecedented disruption of school closures worldwide. In uh, four weeks, we moved from 300 million children out of school to 1.6 billion, which was the number staying uh, for uh, a while. And we learned many lessons. I already mentioned this topic, uh, not going to repeat myself, 
But now it seems that uh, we are struck by amnesia, I would say, and want to simply forget this chapter of our recent history. At UNESCO, we have been paying close attention to this sudden and uh, unattended, unexpected transition, uh, as we think that to see ahead, we had the need to look uh, back. And that's what the publication, publication that we are going to release uh, later today and to be presented, an ad tech tragedy is about. It draws lessons from the ad tech experience on the, pan the pandemic to help us chart a new course in the digital era. But this is not, so please take attention and uh, attend the, the session dedicated to this uh, important uh, collection of qualitative data, and you'll find interesting points, including some answer to the question mark. But now, as already mentioned, uh, this is not the end of the story, uh, just uh, as we emerge from uh, a new class of disruptive technologies. The generative AI came out of the blue, almost out of the blue, at least for people like us, like me, who are not working actively behind the scene in big high tech companies. And let's see how the things are doing uh, still behind the scene. AI applications that generate human-like language raise fundamental issues for knowledge, education, and human learning. I wish to share some uh, information may he, maybe you already have and maybe not. Number one, most AI utilities originate from just one or two countries. That means some world views are being privileged by definition. Number two, almost the entire leadership team at OpenAI, which is one of the main companies working actively on the development of these tools, is under 40 years, which is good. I mean, we don't need boomers everywhere, <laughs> of course. But that means some specific ways of thinking and knowing are being reflected, for sure, in the way the machine is being developed. Number three, this is another important point I already mentioned, but I wish to be very much focused on data. Just 10 of over almost 7,000 natural languages in use around the world are used to access 80% of the 1.8 billion websites and 92% of the open educational resources commons global library is in English. That means that 95% of languages, of world's languages, are excluded. And you can take some uh, reflections from that. Last point, 90% of uh, higher education online courses, materials, I would say materials more than courses, including courses, were created either in the U European Union or North America. That means that the two regions are necessarily prevalent as content producers. So, if we simply see this picture like it is, there is something to reflect upon, and there is something to see how we can address for the near future if we want to keep in mind the mindset, the framework I already mentioned, which is about cultural diversity and the, 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 the relevance of uh, making the entire world part, actively part of this uh, global digital classroom and library. As it, it is digital learning, or should be about. Well, going forward, you can move. We must develop AI technologies in ways that will both protect and expand our varied knowledge system. And to do that, we have to address uh, some critical questions. What do we need to learn? What jobs we will do in the future? Will we need to learn, uh, already mentioned yesterday this point, second and third languages? We will need interpreters, I'm pretty sure, and 
I take the opportunity to thank our great interpreters. Please, uh, you can join me to do that. But we are not sure that in the future we'll need humans doing this job, or airplane pilots, or radiologists, copy editors, and so on. And how we'll assess learning? Previous panelists, Leonardo Garnier just mentioned from Machete to the tractor to change agriculture. And still, it's about taking the same kind of metaphor to see the evolution in the classroom, especially when it comes to assessment and evaluation. And how might a tutors change the work of teachers, which is another interesting part of the story. Well, to cut it short, what will education look like next year, not in the next decade, next year? Of course, I don't have, I suppose we don't have a crystal ball. We don't have, uh, we are not here to give you or to, to share uh, specific answers. But we can for sure build on the many lessons learned and uh, we know we are all aware that we must go deeper in our diagnosis and uh, projections for the future. What should the world with AI look like? More than uh, how can we integrate AI in uh, education? What roles should this powerful technology play? Who decides? That's another good more than philosophical, I would say political question we have to raise up candidly. And you know, UNESCO answers, on our terms, the GEM report, you can move this slide, because I think, yeah. Technology in education uh, reminds us of our agency. Our agency to shape technology, to serve a humanistic goal of education uh, without undermining the importance of this component in the future of education, for the future of education. To be guided by the four principles already mentioned, inclusion, equity, quality, accessibility. Let me provide you with a concrete example which comes from my life and career. I was minister years ago in, in Italy and uh, I remember very well the procedure to validate test books. I don't think it's an Italian stuff. I mean, I think it's a common procedure. When you have a test book, you have to, uh, not as a minister uh, yourself, but you have a, a team, you have a, an agency, you have a, a, a regulatory framework to include and uh, let test books be part of the market for that specific age uh, and level of education. And this procedure is based on uh, some criteria. I remember for us, four of them, possibly they're going to change, accuracy of content, of course, age appropriateness, cultural and social appropriateness, a pedagogical relevance, just the basics, I would say. Well, this process, if I'm not mistaken, can take some uh, pff, one year, one year and a half. So you start the process to, to, to validate for the, the next academic year. And now, do you know how long it takes to validate AI tools? They don't need validation at all. They don't require validation at all. So AI tool can go and can be of course, it's not the same, it's true, because it's not something which has to do yet with a, a, a system of uh, uh, you know, public uh, education recognized and validated by institutionally. But, of course, it's about content, it's about uh, inspiration, it's about tools that children, teachers can use. And uh, they have been, so far, released to into the public space without discussion or review at all. Well, that's why today we are moving without a compass, I you say, direction, a little bit moving into the dark and very fast. 
And in this uh, moment of uncertainty, we are working uh, at UNESCO with countries, uh, with partners, uh, within the UN to navigate these changes in an ethical manner. Ethics for us uh, is really the, the red line, the key word for everything we are discussing here. And uh, I have the pleasure to announce uh, that uh, we are releasing the guidance on generative AI in education uh, in this conference, uh, which provides, we suppose, needed direction. Of course, it's not prescription, it's not our job, but based on evidence, you'll find in this uh, nice publication, evidence and conclusions. And uh, I wish to mention at least three points which I find very interesting for ministers, for uh, the international community at large. Number one, mandating the protection of data privacy, which is a crucial part of the story. Number two, updating existing copyright laws. Number three, defining an age limit for the use of generative AI. That is something which is already in the making, that is something that is already part of the global debate, but we do believe that this should be a very critical point which countries um, and governments have to include in their national debate and in their, hopefully, regulatory frameworks. Well, the guidance stresses also the need for educational institutions to validate Gen AI systems on their ethical and pedagogical appropriateness for education at different levels. So it's about reaffirming the role of uh, institutions and uh, public responsibility to drive the process and not to be driven. Well, to conclude, so please stay tuned on this presentation in the, in the coming sessions. Well, I'm sure that in this room and beyond, you all agree that um, such a complex word could be perceived either as the end of uh, the past or the beginning of the future and something in between, maybe, is the truth. And uh, I do believe that the same perception or the same feeling, so to say, the same uh, uh, kind of collective responsibility was what moved and uh, pushed these uh, personalities you see in this picture in 1945, ministers of education, ministers of education to propose the establishment of uh, an organization which should have through education, science and culture regenerate, rebirth the world in the aftermath of the Second World. Well, I think with the same ambition, with the same responsibility, with the same uh, sense of uh, commitment, we thought that it was important to be assembled here today and to start this uh, new conversation uh, from UNESCO for the best of the world. I thank you very much and I wish you a great conference.